Our first speaker for this session is Prof. Ugo Duminil Kopan. His talk is titled, Critical Phenomena Through the Lens of the Easing Model. The Q&A session will be moderated by Prof. Jonathan Scarlett from the National University of Singapore. Prof. Duminil Kopan, please. Hello. Thank you, thank you for coming. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I will do in this uh, first part, so in the talk, would be to try to give you an overview of what we do in our area through a, a typical example, like one specific model that in some sense encompass a lot of, of what is uh, critical phenomena uh, analysis and statistical physics. And this model is the easing model. So let me start. There will be a number of, of uh, words. This is just to scare you. A number of words that we will go through. Some just brush the surface. Some others we will discuss it much more. And uh, I will begin by doing something that we rarely do, actually. Or at least I feel like I'm missing this in many scientific talks. Is I'm going to try to justify how you cook up a mathematical model for a statistical physics phenomenon. Very often you get you know bombarded with the definition itself and you don't necessarily know where it comes from. So again, it's going to be the easing model uh, that I'm taking as an example. And I'm going to start with an experiment. So I mean, it's a very basic one. That's the best I can do. So I'm going to hit a magnet. OK. And something special happens when you hit a magnet. Oh, wow. That's, uh, I'm doing weird noises. Um, so when you hit a magnet, you don't know it because usually you don't do this on the magnet on your fridge, I mean, if you are normally uh, constituted. But um, if you hit a magnet and you reach a certain temperature, what is going to happen is that the magnet is going to lose its magnetization. So here, of course, gravity is going to make it fall. So this is what happened just here. So loss of magnetization at a certain temperature, which is called Curie temperature. It's uh, according to Pierre Curie who rediscovered it. I'm not sure he was the first discoverer, but as usual in physics, the first discoverer doesn't get the name. So, so, so here, Pierre Curie rediscovered it. He, he made the experiment for several different types of magnets that constitute of different things. You have different Curie temperature, but every single time you get the same phenomenon, loss of, temp of magnetization at a certain temperature. And the question is, how can you explain that mathematically? So a first uh, idea is to create some kind of mathematical caricature of what happens. And you do it by doing a few assumptions, making a few assumptions. So you are going to imagine that your magnet is made of uh, like a lot, I mean, really a lot, actually, of small dipoles. In fact, it's related to the magnetic moment of, of electrons. But this is not going to be important for us here. We are going to think that it's like a collection of a lot of tiny magnets. Okay? And these tiny magnets, we are going to make a few assumptions on them. The first one is that we are going to assume that they are regularly spaced. It's a little bit like you would be forcing the atoms to be regularly spaced. So of course, this is something that is not going to be true in reality. But let's make this assumption for several reasons. It simplifies the, the mathematical uh, study. Second thing, and this is a bigger assumption, is that we are going to assume that our magnets are pointing in one out of two opposite directions. This is not that natural, but we are going to think that in some sense it's totally anisotropic. It's either pointing up or down. And with these two assumptions, well, I can define what I would consider as a mathematician a magnet. It's just going to be a function from the se a certain set of positions, like a subgraph of, say, ZD, into plus minus 1. Plus 1 if it points up, minus 1 if it points down. Okay? So magnet is just a function from the vertices of a graph into plus minus 1 in this model. So that's a magnet. And now we are going to do a second thing that is typical in statistical physics is that, oh, sorry, uh, I, I, I jumped a little bit too fast. And then what I want to measure on my magnet is simple. I want to measure the, the average magnetization. It's kind of average uh, attraction force. And I'm going to just measure it by averaging the spin, the sigma x. Okay. So you see, if 
all the, the, the magnets are pointing up, you get plus one. If roughly half of them are pointing up, half of them are pointing down, you get roughly zero. Okay, okay so now, as I said, you should imagine your magnet as a collection of a huge number of small magnets. So what we are going to do is that we are going to look at the typical behavior of this type of object. It's like completely hopeless to try to understand exactly what is the whole collection of possible magnets and their properties. So we are going to look at typical magnets. So we are going to introduce randomness. And as often in physics, the randomness, how prob probable an object is, is going to be related to its energy. So I need to uh, tell you what's the energy of the magnet in my model. So the energy here is going to be, for every pair of neighboring vertices, I'm going to put an energy minus sigma x, sigma y. So this is simply 1 if the two magnets agree, are pointing in the same direction, uh, minus 1, sorry, and 1 if they disagree. So you have a higher energy for disagreeing uh, spins, so you are favoring magnets for which neighbors are pointing in the same direction. So this is for just a pair of vertices, and then you just sum on everybody to get the total energy or the Hamiltonian of, of, of your magnet. And once you have that, there is a kind of standard recipe to build up a probability measure out of it. The probability of a magnet will be proportional to exponential of minus 1 over t times the energy. So it will be lower if the energy is higher, and how much you take into account the energy is related to this factor t, which is interpreted as a temperature. Okay? Okay, so once you have that, you can, that's called the easing model measure, and you can try to measure the magnetization, but this time you average it. Is it, oh, okay, fine. So the magnetization now, I look at the magnetization of each magnet, but average against the measure. And here, immediately, you observe something a little bit annoying, is that the average magnetization is going to be zero. Why? Because a magnet and its full reverse, when you reverse all the spins, has exactly the, I mean, they both have exactly the same probability. So this is annoying because it doesn't seem to be capturing really anything about a phase transition between a ferromagnetic phase and a, and a, and a, and a paramagnetic phase. And the reason is, um, of course, you could say maybe it's just because you average, you will never capture anything uh, about the thing. But you should think that the average value is kind of the typical value. Here, it's just the problem is that you have two opposite typical values, and they come with the same probability. So I want to break this symmetry. And this is also something that you typically do in statistical physics. So third step after introducing randomness, you break the symmetry, and I'm going to do it in the following way. I'm going to imagine that my magnet is a, a bounded thing. For now, I didn't take a limit. I didn't take an infinite system, even though I'm a mathematician and I love infinity. I didn't do it yet. So what I'm thinking is on the boundary, I'm going to force the spins to be pointing in the plus direction, say. Okay? If you are wondering about this red dot, it's, it's just that once I put this, I was thinking of explaining how you, you create a dynamics on the easing model, then forgot that I put it, but I noticed that this is the moment where people are most focused. You know, they really want to guess where the red dot is going to go. So think, think about it next time you see your cat and <laughs> realize that you are made of the same thing. Um, so anyway, so you force the guys to be plus, and now you take the same measure, except you restrict it what we say, you condition it to having plus boundary condition. All the spins on the side are plus. So now, of course, the symmetry, I mean, reversing all the spins doesn't give you the same thing because you are only allowed to reverse the spins except on the boundary, so you change, a priori, the energy when you reverse all the spins. So in this case, the magnetization, the average magnetization is non-zero. In fact, it's not so difficult to prove it's strictly positive. So you went from equal zero all the time to strictly positive all the time. It's not that good. But you can still do a little bit better is that because your magnet is kind of a huge collection of these small dipoles, you better off think that it's an infinite collection. So take the limit when you take the system 
size to infinity. And there, OK, even though this is strictly positive, the limit has no reason to be strictly positive. So it could be strictly positive, it could be zero. And that's exactly the quantity that we will look at. It's called the spontaneous magnetization. And our question is kind of, is it strictly positive or not? That's for the cooking up of the model. So there was kind of defining the object, introducing randomness, breaking symmetry, and taking the infinite limit. This is kind of the typical uh, uh, um, steps that you go through when you introduce a model. It can be a quantum model. It can be many, many things. It very often follows uh, steps like that, or analogs. OK, so the question now is what do we do with this model? And the first thing is we want to understand if we can see what happens in the experiment. In the experiment, we see this loss of magnetization. So here we are going to translate it like that. Is there a critical temperature below which the spontaneous magnetization is strictly positive? But again, think that now this is the typical magnetization of a magnet. So if it's strictly positive, it means it's a magnet. Or is it zero? In this case, it would mean that you would not have a magnet at this point. OK, so this is called a ferromagnetic phase, and this is called a paramagnetic phase. And you want to understand whether there is such a critical temperature. OK, so that's the point. That's the point. Answer your master, please. Yeah, this is called the critical temperature. I, I'm pointing here, but I, I think it, maybe I should point there. I don't know. Oh, yeah. So that's the point where I want to tell you a little bit about the history of the model, because it's an interesting one. So the model uh, was introduced in the early uh, 20th century, uh, over, uh, I mean, roughly 100 years ago. And uh, it was studied by Ernst Ising. Ising didn't invent the model. Lenz, his advisor, invented it. Ising proved the first thing on it. And what he proved is that if you take a one-dimensional uh, Ising model, so like a one-dimensional magnet, well, the critical temperature is zero, meaning that as soon as you have positive temperature, you get disorder. You, you, you don't have a symmetry breaking. And this, this was disappointing. So Ernst Ising put it like that. You know, I discussed it with Lenz and Pauli, and uh, there was some disappointment that the linear model did not show the expected ferromagnetic uh, properties. I think that's an understatement. It must have been completely devastating. And in fact, uh, Ising left academia after that. So don't do the same if you get uh, your first uh, uh, disappointment. Because what happened is that 20 or 30 years later, he discovered that he was actually one of the most famous, I mean, or at least the most name, uh, I mean, most used name in, in physics. The Ising model is one of the most classical models in physics. OK, the second thing that was very bad is that at the same time almost, you see a few years later, Heisenberg introduced another model for ferromagnetism and a much better model because it's based on quantum physics. The problem is that here, the Ising model is a classical model. There is no uh, quantum uh, physics there. And this is problematic because ferromagnetism takes its roots in, in, uh, in the quantum uh, realm. So, so this model is much better. So that's a second strike against this Ising model. And at this stage, one can naturally wonder why I'm talking to you about uh, this model. I mean, of course, there is the easy answer that I'm a mathematician, so I do things that are much simpler than physicists. But, uh, but it goes a little bit beyond that. that. Uh, so there are some pros. The first thing is that Ising actually conjectured something catastrophic. He conjectured that this is always the case. The critical temperature is always zero, whatever the dimension. And in fact, he is very wrong. I mean, you cannot be more wrong in some sense. It's always strictly positive except in dimension one. And when I mean this, it's, you can even create like fractal graph that will have dimension 1.0001. They will have strictly positive temperature. So, so it's really a specificity of linear systems. And this was discovered by Rudolf Peirce that at least in dimension two and three, three being the most interesting one, you have uh, strictly positive temperature. So at least it saves a little bit the model. But a second point, which is probably more interesting, in fact, is that Peirce, it, it happens to be Peirce as well, but it could have been another person, discovered that 
several models at the time, some really describing very different things, like binary alloys or things like that, were in fact modeled independently by the same model, the Ising model again. In binary alloys, you know, maybe it was called 0 and 1 to denote like uh, the first kind or the second kind of molecules, but it was actually the same thing. And in fact, cooperative phenomena in general are fairly well modeled by the, by, by the Ising model. Recent applications of the Ising model are much more of the kind, you know, you take neuroscience and you look, you look at uh, neural networks and you have like cooperation between different uh, neurons and the Ising model pops up here and it's actually probably more fundamental than, than or, or better uh, describing the reality than Ising model for ferromagnetism. So this idea that a bad model can be a bad model for many different phenomena, which makes it a much better model, is something that appears at the time. So this was two important things that kind of saved the Ising model for sufficiently long that something happened uh, in the 40s. So in the 40s, Lars Onzager, who was a chemist, I mean, so of course the theoretical chemists at the time were very close for some of them, and this includes Onzager, uh, to mathematicians. I mean, of course they would not like me to say that, but. Uh, so Lars Onzager got the Nobel Prize in chemistry, but one, one beautiful result that he obtained, I don't know what this place is, but uh, a beautiful result that he obtained is that the free energy, so the free energy is kind of the typical energy per unit of, uh, of volume in your magnet. Don't, don't bother too much about this definition, but the free energy can be computed exactly when you take a two-dimensional model. And this is really a mathematical tour de force. It's a beautiful result, and it has many applications. So first, it has many applications, but even more than that, it has many proofs. So Bruyer Kaufmann found a simplification of Onzager's original argument, which is tough, even by, uh, by mathematician standards. But from there, I mean, there, was, there has been like tons of different proof of these results involving combinatorics, algebra, analysis. I mean, there is this paper that is called the 399th solution of the Ising model, which means the 399th way of proving that. So, so don't think that mathematicians are all weird, right? It's a <laughs> yes, we try to reprove things. I mean, this 399th is maybe a slight exaggeration, but there are many, many, many different ways of doing it. And the reasons why people love to try to, to prove that is that once you have the free energy, you actually get many, many things. And one good example is Chen Ning Yang, the same Yang as in physics, you know, uh, Yang Mills, Li Yang, uh, uh, Baxter Yang, I mean, all, I mean, all this is the same uh, genius physicist. He obtained, by a refinement of this technique, he obtained a few years later the spontaneous magnetization that I was mentioning, an exact formula for the spontaneous magnetization. This exact formula is this thing. I mean, it's, it's fairly simple. And in particular, here the plus is the positive part of this. So you see that this is strictly positive only when t is smaller than this value. So in two dimensions, not only tc is strictly positive, but you can compute explicitly the critical point, and you can compute explicitly the spontaneous magnetization. By the way, one of the reasons why this result is so important is that here, you see, you get a weird exponent, 1, 8. It tells you that the spontaneous magnetization, when t approaches tc, behaves like t minus tc to the power 1, 8. So 1, 8 is a critical exponent. And this is one of the first non-trivial examples where you could prove what we call a non-mean field exponent. So usually, you do a mean field approximation. In some sense, you get rid of the geometry in your system and you manage to do something. Sometimes you don't even manage because it can remain a very difficult problem. But for the Ising model, for instance, it's very easy to compute explicitly the critical exponent. And you will get one half if you do the mean field approximation. So here, you get something different. And this is one of the reasons, uh, one of the results that gave birth to modern uh, statistical, I mean, at least critical phenomena analysis, because here, there was this, this realization that you can get different exponents, 
In fact, you can get them, for instance, also on the triangular lattice, on the hexagonal lattice. You will get the same exponent, so this also was at the basis of the observation that you should have universality, that the precise definition of your model doesn't matter so much, you should get the same critical exponent, etc., etc. So this is a very, very fundamental point. Okay. Um, this, all these results, they are based on an important uh, property that is called integrability. Integrability is some way of computing explicitly things. So here I gave you exact formulas for each one of these quantities, Tc or, or the min spontaneous magnetization. But you have to understand that this property of integrability is a very versatile property. It disappears very quickly. So here, for instance, if you are on the square lattice, it's true. In fact, on any planar graph, it's true. But imagine, I mean, there, there was an assumption that I made which may think at least physically extremely wrong. And this assumption was that the, the, the dipoles interact with each other only through nearest pairs. You only see the next guys around you, but you don't see at farther distance. And this is, I mean, you may think that this is the strongest interaction, but thinking it's the only interaction is probably completely wrong. So imagine that I'm adding an interaction between this guy and this guy, so a distance two. Even a tiny, tiny one, like, you know, uh, it was plus minus one, put plus minus 0 0.000001. Integrability breaks down. You lose immediately your ability to compute explicitly things. So it's not bad news because in some sense computing explicitly things is probably not the right way to physically understand a system. But it's true that this was a good tool for you to try to, to, to use exact computation to compute this thing. So what do you do when you lose it? And I want to uh, advertise one approach that I didn't come up with, but I use a lot in my, in my uh, everyday life. And I'm going to exemplify it through one specific problem, which is that once you know that there is a phase transition, there is a natural question. It's to decide whether it's a continuous phase transition or a discontinuous phase transition. So here, you want to know whether the spontaneous magnetization is a continuous function of T, meaning that it's going to decrease continuously up to zero and then stay zero above the, the critical temperature, or whether it's discontinuous. And for D equal to, when you look at the expression that I gave you, the exact expression, you see that it behaves continuously. And in fact, in natural uh, magnets, it also behaves like that. So can you prove that in dimension three, for instance? This is one of the most basic and naive questions you could ask on the model, but surprisingly, it resisted for a long time because people were losing this exact uh, integrability, this ability to compute exactly things. So let me tell you a little bit how we did prove this result. So this is a result with Michael Eisenman and Vlada Sidoravicius. So indeed, in dimension three, it's continuous. In fact, you only have to prove that at the critical point, the spontaneous magnetization is zero. It's, uh, it's sufficient to prove the continuity. And I want to tell you a little bit about the proof. So idea of the proof, so close the doors. I'm afraid that I don't know how many people are mathematicians, how many people are. But don't worry, I'm just going to give an idea of the thing. It's not that you are going back to school <laughs> and get traumatized again. Um, so, in order to tell you about the, the proof, I need to tell you about a new player, not the spontaneous magnetization, but the spin-spin correlation. So the spin-spin correlation is just the average of the product of spin is just to tell you how much spins have a tendency to align with each other, okay? Just average the product. If it's zero, that means that giving information on the first one gives you no information on the second one, it's just independent. But if it's strictly positive, it's measuring how much they have a tendency to align. This is the formula for it. Whatever, you actually take even the limit. And one thing I can tell you is the following. If I take two spins and I look at the spin-spin spin correlation, what is going to happen is that when I let one spin go to infinity, then the spin-spin correlation is going to converge towards the product of the spin 
average here and the spin average here. Things become independent when you bring them to infinity. This is fairly natural. And what you get, in fact, is that you get a spontaneous magnetization square. The average of one spin is a spontaneous magnetization. That's also why we introduce it like that. I introduce it, it as a, an average on the whole magnet, but in fact, I could also think of one dipole and check its, its average. Okay, and there is a second thing, much uh, more difficult to prove, but anyway, I don't have time to do it, so I'm gonna just act like it's simple, is that uh, the spin-spin correlation tends to zero, in fact, when x goes to infinity. So if you combine the two things, it looks complete uh, at Tc. It looks completely obvious that the spontaneous magnetization is gonna be exactly equal to zero. So probably I will not be in front of you if this was the case. And the reason is that there is a catch, and the catch is, here, here I looked at the measure when I break the symmetry. Here, when I'm able to prove that it goes to zero, I'm actually taking the measure where I don't break the symmetry. And that's very different measures a priori. It's what we call two Gibbs states. It's like two states of matter. And in some sense, what I'm gonna have to prove is that I need to prove that they are the same. That this measure and this one are the same and this is something typical from continuous phase transition is that at the critical point, you have a unique state of matter. Okay, how do we do that? Well, I mean, I, in France, I, I call it the true normand and everybody understands. So the true normand is this moment in the, in the long dinner where you need a rest. So you drink this very strong alcohol and it basically dilutes everything you ate up to this point and you are back for a second half. But I realize that I have only three minutes left, so <laughs> it's gonna be a short second half, um, or a light true normal, I don't know. So the true normal is gonna be the following. I'm gonna talk to you about something completely different, and it's called percolation theory. So for people that will be unlucky and will attend my talk on, on Friday, I will talk actually mostly about percolation theory. And percolation theory is a model for porous medium. How do you model a porous medium like coal, for instance? So what you do is that you imagine it as a random graph. You have an original graph, and you pick the edges of this graph at random. So for instance, here what I could say is that the red edges are selected with probability p and not selected with probability 1 minus p. I get a random subgraph of my original graph, and I look at the connectivity properties of this graph. And what I did here is that I did a simulation, or my student did a simulation, at two different values of p, of the probability that each edge is in my graph. And the color are the connected components of my graph. From where can I go to where? If I have the same color, I can go from one to the other. What you notice here, p is equal to 0 0.4099, I think. Here, you get tiny islands, so tiny connected components. Here, it's not that I, made a mistake in the simulation, p is equal to 0 0.501, I think, something like that, so tiny bit more. And here you have a huge red area. This red area is actually one connected component. So you have a drastic change of behavior between a phase where you have only small components and a phase where you have a big one. In fact, you have an infinite one even. So this, if I would be able to draw something infinite, this red uh, thing would go to infinity. So this is a phase transition between subcritical phase of percolation, PC is one half here, so there is a change at one half, where you have small connected components and here where you have a unique large one. So what's the connection between this story and the Ising model? Well, the, the connection is the following. Oh, by the way, uh, there were, this was invented in the 60s, but there were experiments trying to really study the porosity of medium that dates back uh, well uh, before that, and Rosalind Franklin in particular, the same as for DNA, did some very interesting experiment on coal to see, depending on the temperature, depending on the size of the molecule, which gas is going through coal, I mean, is percolating through coal or not. Okay, I have 46 seconds, so that's my last slide. Good, in fact, I have like 200 more, but, uh, I didn't know how long I should be doing, so. Um, so let me just finish with this slide. 
So what the connection is that pair collision, in fact, saves the day when you study the easing model. What happens is that you cannot compute in dimension three. You cannot compute TC. I don't know. I cannot tell you what is the value of TC. I cannot tell you what is the formula for M star of T. Of T. But I can connect the spin-spin correlations to a pair correlation model, relating it to the probability that zero, so the spin-spin correlation is going to be probability that zero is connected in my random graph to X for a certain pair correlation model. More complicated than the one I just described. This was what we call Bernoulli pair correlation. Here it's a much more complicated one. But you have this connection. And the beautiful thing is that you can also measure the difference between the spin-spin correlation for the plus measure and the spin-spin correlation without the symmetry breaking. And the difference between the two is going to be the probability that 0 and x are connected to infinity in this percolation model. But now, and this is going to be the end story, notice that in the previous picture, in my percolation model, when I had this red area, this red connected component, it was overwhelming. It was clearly unique. There was one unique infinite connected component. The second biggest was tiny. Well, it's also the same thing in this percolation model. So if 0 and x are connected to infinity, they must be connected together. There is no choice. But if they are connected together, thanks to the uniqueness, well, I can use this bound here to bound this quantity. So I get that the plus spin-spin correlation is bounded by twice the spin-spin correlation without symmetry breaking. But good for me, this tends to 0, and this tends to the spontaneous magnetization. So the spontaneous magnetization is equal to 0. And I will finish here just to tell you, I hope I gave you this idea. Oh, it's even blinking. <laughs> I think somebody is going to try to tackle me now. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm ready. Um, so so the, the bottom line is that there is this connection between two models that explain completely different phenomena, cooperative phenomena on one side, porous medium on the other one. But there is a mathematical connection between the two. And once you explore this kind of dictionary between these two different worlds, a question that is very difficult on one side become a question of kind of drawing things on the other. OK, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, this, this one, yeah. next seat. Yeah. Ah, you sit here? Yeah. I sit here. OK, whoa. OK, uh, that's what they told me. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much, Professor yeah. Dumil Copin, for the excellent talk. Um, I'd like to ask the audience members, encourage you to step up to the microphones and yeah, have any questions you have. Um, please don't be shy. <laughs> no one's walking up yet. Okay, some are starting. So I, I guess I'll start with a quick question. Um, it seems this problem can vary a lot in difficulty depending on the dimension. Um, you, dimension two perhaps looked a bit easier. You talked about dimension three a lot and perhaps non-integer dimensions. So is it like from three onwards, it gets extremely difficult? And do we care most about three because we live in a 3D world? I'm curious about the So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. And if I had uh, more time, I would actually go to the next uh, dimension, which is dimension four. So one has to be very careful. You know, if you say that you walk in dimension four in the streets, I mean, people may think that you are crazy. Uh, that's how my wife uh, fell in love with me, but uh, so, so usually it doesn't work that way. So dimension four, I mean, we have to be careful because you think sometimes that uh, dimension four is going to be non-natural. In the case of the easing model, I would actually say that this is the most natural dimension because the easing model is related through uh, Vick rotation to quantum physics. And in quantum physics, we live in a four-dimensional world because the dimension of space and time add up. And the time dimension in the case of this Vick rotation correspond to a standard, like just one more dimension in your system. So the four dimensional easing model is actually probably the most interesting one from the point of view of quantum physics. And uh, it's related there. You want to understand whether it allows you to create an interesting quantum field theory. And one of the things that we did with Michael Eisenman again was to prove that it doesn't. So, I mean, physicists were predicted that it doesn't, but we prove it mathematically. It's already much simpler than in dimension three to study that's the simple. four dimension. Right? Okay, it's and kind of intuitive. Five and more is like uh, much, much simpler. Yeah. Okay, that's, it's a bit kind of intuitive that, yes, three is somehow hardest and we coincidentally live in a 3D world. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, uh, that's the luck that we have, or the bad luck. I don't know. I find it as uh, something uh, good news because that means it's more intriguing. Okay. But indeed, uh, the hardest dimension is the dimension of real life magnets. Okay. Um, looks like there's a few questions now. Please go ahead. 
Hello. Hello. Uh, nice talk, Professor. Uh, I'm Hani Sidik. Uh, I'm a fellow of uh, Singapore Academies. Uh, actually, I'm a physicist. So for my PhD research, I studied uh, magnetic material. So I'm familiar with the uh, IC model, Heisenberg model. So it's refreshing to see uh, the model coming from uh, other view, like from mathematician. So uh, actually, uh, like Heisenberg model and Heisenberg model is, uh, we, uh, like physicists trying to solve it with quantum computer. Do you know anything about it or can you give your opinion about so that? So that I, uh, yeah, I don't know uh, of this, uh, th this kind of works. Uh, so the Heisenberg model is definitely something that we try to work on. It's, uh, it's much less integrable than uh, the Ising model. So it's, it's harder to compute. I mean, we don't know how to compute the critical uh, parameter or to compute the magnetization. In fact, one of the big questions in our field is to prove that the 2D Heisenberg model has a discontinuous, uh, I mean, doesn't have a phase transition, that it's always exponential decay, uh, whatever the temperature. So we, so a lot of what I said on the Ising model doesn't extend to the Heisenberg model. Now there are connections with percolation models still, so that's one of the things that we are exploring, just that the percolation model gets harder and harder. I described to you a percolation model where edges are just chosen to be red or gray independently. You can guess that this is not what happens for the model that is connected to the Ising model, because if you make this analogy in your brain, like if you tell that a magnet is pointing up, right, at least for the neighbors, they are pushed to point up. There is clearly a, con a correlation between the different magnets, and the percolation model associated to it will also have long range dependencies. For Heisenberg, you also get a model like that. It's just that these dependencies are even harder to, uh, to handle. So we are a little bit in the dark here. And uh, that's for you to come and help us. Uh, next, gener next generation uh, work. Yeah. Thanks. Um, maybe we'll do one more on this side. Thank you Paul, for sharing this uh, easy model. And uh, it's a very, like, uh, make me to understand. Actually, I, I, I'm not in this field. I am. Uh, a uh, PhD student from Singapore University of Technology and Design. My major is basically more like a statistics. Uh, but uh, when you mentioned like the break the symmetry uh, at the boundary and you extend it uh, and you extend this to the whole uh, lattice, yeah. uh, is it something like a one point complex, a compactification? Or a, it's like to glue all the boundary into one point, but this... That, that is true, that is true, but uh, you don't use... Yeah, I, I don't see it as a compactification. Oh, I mean... But, uh, oh. but, but one thing that, uh, that your question raised is whether that was the right thing to do. To, uh, so I should say that a physicist uh, in the room may feel shocked by the fact that I'm telling that the way of breaking the symmetry is to just use the boundary vertices to be plus, because the way you break a symmetry for a magnet is that you put it in a magnetic field. But the magnetic field is going to impact every single uh, dipole in your, uh, in your magnet, right? So normally, you should actually define it differently. You should twist the energy by the fact that maybe you get an energy edge if you are pointing up and minus edge if you point down. And then what you do is you take the limit and you let h tends to zero. And you will end up with the same object that when you go, you take this plus boundary condition and you bring them to infinity. Uh, is this will be the same as just fix one point to be the positive and the extent? It happened that you would also get the same. Uh, no, uh, what, what do you mean by, no, no, you, need, uh, you still need to impact uh, okay. uh, like a density of points or the whole boundary. Okay. If you only condition one guy to be plus, this is not going to be sufficient to okay. create a potentially different uh, model. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, okay. Um, we have time for maybe two more. Um, I think you were next. Um, hello, Professor. Thank you for the talk. So my question is, in real magnets, magnetic dipoles are not pointing either up or down. They're distributed according to a certain solid angle. Mm -hmm. So 
In which case, how would the associated percolative model work? Because they are not either completely correlated or completely disconnected. So, so you raise a good point. Here, this was a huge simplification to take this total asymmetry. I mean, in general, you will expect that it can go in any direction or maybe indeed point in some, uh, some quadrant or some, some direction of the space. You have to, I mean, the percolation model emerges in a very indirect way. It's not necessarily like here you could think maybe uh, pointing up, I color red, pointing down, I color blue, and I get this, uh, I just keep the red edges, right? Uh, the red vertices, and this gives me my kind of percolation. It's actually not the percolation that I mentioned. The percolation very often comes out of an expansion of the spin-spin correlation. So there is no problem with doing it in the case where you have your spin is allowed to vary in a certain quadrant or in a certain space. In fact, you have percolation representation for spin systems where the spin is lying in a non uh, non-commutative Lie group or something like that. There is no problem with it. OK, thank you. Thanks. OK, one more over here. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Fred. I'm studying math at Stanford and probability, but not this stuff. Um, so I was kind of curious, somewhat related to the last two questions, if you have an external field, can you still connect it through percolation and understand yes. phase transitions in that? Yeah, there is no problem. In fact, you can. The connection with percolation works on any graph, so you don't even need that it's regular. That it it, it can work on a on a random network with no problem, and it can work with a magnetic field. The magnetic thing is just going to correspond to have what we call a ghost vertex, Griffith ghost vertex, that is connected to all the vertices in your graph, and then the percolation will have this additional vertex on top of it that it's allowed to connect to. Otherwise, there is no problem. Absolutely no. Thank you. Uh, we do have time for one more. Did you still want to? <clears throat> you answered my question a little bit. Can you explain more about the percolation model that you have at the end, like that last slide? At the last slide, so what you do uh, is that it's, it's actually uh, stupidly simple or stupidly smart. It's not my uh, invention, uh, by the way. Um, but it was, it was actually uh, introduced by Griffiths, Hurst, and Chairman to try to, to get correlation inequalities. So what you do is that if you look at exponential of minus 1 over th, I have two minutes. I'm going to use all of it. OK, I'm please. Surf in, please do. Yeah. Suffer until the end. So um, uh, e to the minus 1 over th of sigma, so it's the product of e to the 1 over t sigma x sigma y for every pair sigma x. And what you do, you take e to the 1 over t sigma x sigma y, and you Taylor expand it. Every e to the 1 over t sigma x sigma y, you Taylor expand it. And what you see is that you are just going to divide between the cases where in your Taylor expansion, nx, let's call it nxy, so sum of nxy equals 0 to infinity of blah, blah. So nxy, you are just going to say, I'm going to put the edge red if nxy is strictly positive. I will put it gray if it's zero. And I do that for every single edge in my thing because my exponential of minus 1 over t h of sigma is the sum of every single pair of edges. And so you do that, and you end up with a actually very cool model, a very cool percolation model, very, very dependent. They are like, for instance, they are source constraint. Like the every vertex will have to have an even number of red edges incident to it. This is something you don't see in the percolation model, the Bernoulli percolation model that I described. Except at 0 and x, where you need to have an uh, odd thing, and then yeah, there is a twist around it, because otherwise 0 and x will always be connected. But it's, it's how you do it. But you see that, that kind of uh, bounce on the question before. It's not at all related to whether it's pointing up or down. It's, it's a much more convoluted way. And I have 10 more seconds to say that this is actually commonly what you do in, in, in a lot of different statistical models. You can have this expansion in percolation uh, processes. Thank you. Yeah. That was exquisite timing. <laughs> I'm Swiss, uh, you know. I mean, I'm French, but uh, <laughs> I so live in Swiss. Uh, thanks for the great <laughs> questions, and thank you, thank you again. Thank you.